Right, now my pleasure bringing you Miss Sarah Gentry, our last presentation. Kreska Scientia Vita Excelitur. So, go ahead, Miss Gentry. Odysseus and Huckleberry Finn are two of history's most well-known fictional heroes. Though Huck is usually thought of as more a comedic character, one can certainly find a throw of nature in his character. While these two may have dif had different battles in the literal sense, there are many similarities in how they deal with whatever troubles they face, and many ways one can take examples from them. These characters are both great thinkers. Their quick wit is especially prominent in the face of danger, which is not only admirable, but also te teaches a valuable lesson to readers that sometimes brains are better than brawn. Even when accompanied by greedy companions or forced with moral dilemmas, they were able to conquer whatever troubles arose and eventually found their own happy endings. These characters are both highly inspirational, especially in the sense that they had many qualities that can be related relatable to readers, thus spurring them to want to achieve more, just as Huckleberry and Odysseus did. Both so, so these characters possess great wit and are great thinkers in the face of danger. Huck showed great intelligence several times during his story. His ideas are beyond being creative, and while he is young, his plans, for the most part, are practical and turn out well. One of the first examples shown in the adventures of occurs while he pretended to have been murdered by robbers in order to escape his crazy and abusive father. The night before, his father had been specially drunk and nearly killed poor Huck. When he eventually passed out, Huck grabbed Pap's, Pap's gun from the wall and aimed it at the sleeping man. He eventually fell asleep, and when he woke to, and when he woke to his father questioning the presence of the gun, he told him that there were robbers attempting to get into the house and that he had been lying in wait for them. This already shows his incredibly sharp wit, being able to spin a believable lie, especially while still in the haze of waking up. The following night, he packed supplies in his canoe that he had found drifting down the river and found a wild pig. He shot the pig and brought it back to the house, leaving it to bleed on the ground. He took everything of value in the house and took an axe to the door. Once he had disposed of the wild pig's body, the house looked as if it had really been accosted by robbers. He left some of his own hair by the bloody axe as a final touch and went off on his way free. One of Odysseus's most fam famous and well known feats is the perfect example to show his sharp blood. In a story of an escape, similar to the example given for Huckleberry Finn, Odysseus and his men found themselves on the island of the Cyclops. They ended up trapped by the Cyclops, who went by the name of Polyphemus. After he had eaten a few of their men, Odysseus came up with a plan. Um, it started by getting the Cyclops very drunk. He and his men then used an olive stake, which they had let sit in the embers of the monster's fire, and they thrust it into Polyphemus' eye, making sure that every part of it was destroyed. When the Cyclops awoke, screaming in pain, he called to his friends for assistance. However, Odysseus had earlier told him that he went by the name of Nobody, so when his friends, when he told his friends that nobody is killing me now by fraud and not by force, they refused to help him, as they thought he might have been attacked by a plague from the gods. They lumbered off, but laughter filled my heart to think how nobody's name, my great cunning stroke, had duped them one and all. By the time the next morning had come, Odysseus' plan to escape the grasps, the grasps of the blinded Cyclops was already in motion. He and his men secured themselves under the belly of the, of the bellies of Polyphemus' rams, and when he let the beasts out, he was unknown unknowingly releasing his prisoners and his soldiers. From there, Odysseus and his crew were able to make it back to their ship, and after an unpleasant encounter with Poseidon, they sailed off. And from there, we sailed on, glad to escape our death, yet sick at heart for the comrades we had lost. No ordinary person could come up with a strategy such as these characters have, never mind having the ability to carry out those strategies. Perhaps this is the benefit of fiction, where everything either goes horribly right or horribly wrong. Either way, the intelligence of these two heroes is certainly admirable, and is a part of what makes them so comparable to those who read their stories. This likeness to such admirable characters is bound to strike inspiration in the hearts of readers to strive to do something more with what qualities they have. Huckleberry, Finn, and his Odysseus shared a very similar experience, and while the consequences were slightly, slightly different, it is quite interesting that they shared this specific experience. 
Both of these heroes are seen disguising themselves in one way or another at some point during their stories. Not only that, but their motives for donning such disguises were quite comparable. That reason being that they were both disguising themselves in order to gain information. Hawk wanted to know the status of him and Jim's disappearances. Odysseus wanted to gain knowledge of his life suitors as well as to give himself time to form a plan to slaughter said suitors. He went in disguise because the goddess Athena, Athena warned him that he would be killed if he returned as himself, especially without any sort of plan. Huckleberry Finn's motives were akin to these, as he was fearful of what might happen to him if his father or Jim's owner discovered that he was still alive. He was afraid of his father because surely he would be beaten and forced to give his money to pay for his drink, and he was fearful of his foxen because it would not have been difficult for one to piece together the fact that Huckleberry and Jim disappeared around the same time period. Huck's disguise was of a little girl. Then he studied it over and said, couldn't I put on some of the old things and dress up like a girl? That was a good notion too. So he shortened up one of the powerful gowns and I turned up my trouser legs to my knees and got into it. Jim hitched it behind with the hooks and it was a fair foot. I put, I put on the sunbonnet and tied it under my chin. Odysseus's disguise was that of, a, of an old beggar with assistance from Athena. She shriveled the supple skin out on his wide limbs, stripped the russet curls from his head, covered his body top to toe with the wrinkled hide of an old man, and dimmed the fire in his eyes, so shiny once. He wanted to see which of his followers were still loyal to him, and to investigate the suitors and cause general chaos among them without gaining suspicion. Without his disguise, he and Athena would not have been able to formulate such an advanced plan, and the moment when he reveals himself to be alive would have been much, much less climactic and successful. Interestingly enough, now, though, both of these heroes' disguises were suggested by their companions. Jim, the former slave, and Huck's traveling companion suggested the idea to Huck. His disguise did not go quite as well as Odysseus's did, and he was soon discovered to not be who he claimed to be. Both of these characters don disguises out of an inclination to not be discovered. So this shows that these heroes are not fearless. Truly, it has already been shown that they are capable of feeling and showing fear. This does not make them any less heroic, as one does not need to be fearless to be a hero. Some may even say that one who shows much fear but perseveres through it is the greatest kind of hero. These characters fear through these characters fear shows readers that they are indeed human and. If these characters can be called heroes, even though they fear death just as much as any other human being, what is preventing others from doing heroic deeds as well? For Odysseus and Huckleberry Finn are not only characters that readers can look up to, but they can also relate to, and can show readers what they can achieve, what they can be, even with flaws. Both of these characters encountered a wide variety of evils, whether it be Odysseus and Polyphemus, the Cyclops, and Scylla, the head-to-head monster, or Huckleberry Finn and his pap, his father, and the con men that accompanied Huck. While there are major differences between these monsters, they fit in their stories perfectly. Odysseus's story would not have been right if his villains were earthier and more human-like, and the same with Huck. This story would have been greatly changed and would not have been the same, would not have had the same impact that it does if he had been forced to faced with mythological creatures, such as Odysseus had met. Each character's trials relate to their own stories, and to their character's growth. Odysseus had, assumably, already faced some of the moral and mental challenges that Huck faces in his own childhood, so it would not make sense for his story to, story to consist of these challenges again. As for Huck, it is a similar matter. He would not be realistic if it was if he was expected to face such monsters as Odysseus had, especially at such a young age, and it would narrow down the opportunities for character growth. Aside from those factors, to take matter more literally, Odysseus' story is of mythology and not meant to be realistic or relatable. However, Huck's story is quite the opposite. It is meant for you to look at him and be able to relate to him, and to feel as if they could go on such adventures as well. These stories capture readers because they appear to be exciting tales on the surface, but they are also heroic tales that can give one motivation to act and live a particular way. They are more than just adventure stories. They are stories to show readers how they can live heroically on their own journeys. They teach readers what assets they have, that they can aid them 
the access, access they have that can aid them in achieving their own greatness. Both of these characters are at some point during their journeys accompanied by men who are fully selfish and who do not listen to anyone other than themselves. The men in Augustus's crew brought him more harm than good. They went behind his back several times and caused him much hardship. One of the devastating examples was, the, was during the disaster of the Bag of the Winds, where Odysseus was in possession of a sack, the skin of a full-grown ox, finding inside the winds that howl from every quarter. For Zeus had made Aeolus the master of all the winds, with power to calm them or lose them as he pleased. After nine days and nights of sailing, they had nearly reached the shores of their destination. Odysseus was suddenly overcome by the urge to sleep, and while he was resting, his crew alighted upon the idea that Odysseus was carrying treasures in his sack, and that he was too greedy to share it with the rest of them. But the crew began to mutter among themselves. Sure, I was following Tros, gold and silver home, the gifts of open-hearted Aeolus, Tedesus' son. They opened the sack while Odysseus was still asleep, and the winds erupted from it, whisking them on their ship all the way back to Aeolus' land. Huckleberry Finn ended up accompanied by two men, and known in the story as the Duke and the King. These names themselves are enough to show that these men were extremely duty and self-centered. The frogs caused Huck and Jim many troubles along their journey. They would swing the money out of every time they came by, whether it be by force charm or meter of awkward performances. The first of these crimes was when they went to a church meeting in the town of Pokeville. The king dressed up as a pirate and somehow managed to convince the preacher to let him speak to the church. He told them of the many hardships he had endured and how he was in search of men for a new crew when he was robbed and stranded outside their town. He told them that it was the blessed thing that ever happened to him because he was a changed man now and happy for the first time in his life. And poor as he was, he was going to start right off and work his way back to the Indian Ocean and put in the rest of his life trying to turn the pirates into the true path. Mm -hmm. He told them, whenever he converted a new pirate, that he would tell them not to thank him, but to give credit to those in the church. Don't you thank me, don't you give me no credit. It all belonged to them dear people in Hopeville Camp Meeting, natural brothers and benefactors of the race, and that dear preacher there, the truest friend the pirate ever had. He brought everyone in the room to tears, and they soon took up a collection for him. They even went so far as to let the king go around the church himself, holding out his hat as if people, as people gave their money to him. He had no guilt about it, only saw it as a gain. If anything, this success of his bolstered his and the duke's confidence, driving them to con more people and draw Huck and Jim into it. Though these characters were caused much trouble by these men, these troubles can show readers the difference between heroes and the evils they face. There are many evils in the world that one will undoubtedly face at one time or another, and they can cause irreparable harm. But if characters such as Huckleberry Finn and Odysseus, and Odysseus can persevere, perhaps those who read their stories can as well. Additionally, these evils give a great contrast and show readers the true difference between actions that are wrong and right. After all, it is plain to see when a character is fighting for what is good and right when there is a and evil to be fought. Of course, there are many differences between these great heroes. For one, one is a fully grown adult with a wife and child, and with much life experience. The other is a 13-year-old boy with very different life experiences, and much less so. These differences alone are enough to show the vastness of the divide. Odysseus, at the beginning of his story, had been married, had a child who is now fully grown, and had gone to and survived a war. Huck's life so far at the beginning of his life had, consi had consisted of his skipping school, playing make-believe with his friend, and attempting to escape his father. Huck played games of pirates, robbers, and war, while Odysseus had actually encountered people and monsters like those, and much worse. One example that shows this massive age gap and maturity gap is when um, Huckleberry decided to trick Jim. They had been split up for a few days after their wrath had been wrecked. And when they found each other again, Huck thought it would be hilarious to trick Jim into thinking that the whole ordeal had been a figment of his imagination, and that it was all a dream. Well, hang it all, you did dream it, because there didn't any of it happen. However, once Huck eventually showed him the wreckage of their raft, Jim immediately knew he had been deceived. 
He was incredibly upset by this, and when Chuck realized that, it was a big milestone for him. It was 15 minutes before I could work myself to go up and humble myself to him, but I'd done it, and I weren't ever sorry for it afterwards, neither. I didn't do him no more mean tricks, and I wouldn't have done it if I had known it would make him feel that way. All his life, he had been taught the slaves were essentially like animals and didn't have feelings, or at least that their feelings were important. When Huck saw how important and betrayed Jim felt, he saw that his emotions were as real as his own, and that they were not all diff that different after all. All humans beings have flaws and faults, and what is what and what makes one heroic is not a lack of faults, but if and how they confront them. It is important to see that everyone has faults, but all can confront those faults and better themselves. As Huck was so young, his ideas of what is and is not moral were malleable then, were more malleable than that a, an adult might be. There was a time when he was incredibly conflicted about whether it was right for him to help a slave from slavery, escape from slavery. slavery. Jim said it made him all over trembly and feverish to be so close to freedom. Well, I can tell you it made me all trembly and feverish too to hear him, because I began to get it through my head that he was most free. And who was to blame for it? Why me? He had a great moment of internal crisis. Jim, the slave who he had been helped escape, was soon to be free. According to all that Huck had ever been taught, it was completely unethical for him to help a slave, as slaves, slaves were considered to be private property in his time. In Huck's head, he was being treasonous to everything he ever knew. Because of this, he had immense guilt and doubt and wished ill things ahead of himself. He even went so far as to leave Jim under the pretense of scouting out what was ahead of them, but he was stopped and eventually returned to Jim. Then I thought a minute and says to myself, hold on, suppose you'd have done all right and give Jim up. Would you feel better than what you do now? No, says I, I'd feel bad. I'd feel just the same way I do now. He decided to stick with Jim and that he would give him to freedom, no matter what, whether it was right or wrong of him to do so. This incredible strength is rare, especially as he was so young, and this strength has the ability to teach readers to think for themselves, except exercising the ability to examine situations and make their own decisions on the matter, and not simply follow the rest of society. No matter the differences or similarities there may be between Huckman and Odysseus, they are both inspirations to those who read their short stories. Authors like to not only create heroes that are relatable in one way or another, but also make it so that those traits aid them in achieving great things. Everyone enjoys reading about something inspiring, and it can even impact readers in their day-to-day -day life. One who reads of a character that they have traits in common with, and that goes to great deeds, might be inspired to do great things themselves. Seeing characters be heroic, relatable or not, tends to stress a sort of inspiration in one making one want to be like that hero and to be a better version of oneself. Reflection is important. It is beneficial, it is beneficial to, to examine these characters and stories because it can help better one's understanding of what a heroic person is like. One may not have an incredible strength or a mighty sidekick, sidekick um, but that is not, not all that a hero is. A hero is much more than such physical assets, and when, we're, when one realizes it, one does not need them. One can realize that they themselves have many common traits with these heroes, thus inspiring them further to try and better the world, even in the littlest way. Both Huckleberry Finn and Odysseus' stories teach readers that it is entirely, entirely possible for the average person to achieve their goals and live a good, better life with that knowledge and confidence. Everyone is on a life journey, and the quality of one's life reflects the success of their journey. It may not be easier to journey through life, but one can learn from characters such as these in order to better the quality of their journey. All right, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ms. Gentry. Very nicely done. Um, I would like to have you just kind of begin by explaining to us a little bit the distinction. Um, what are the different virtues that we learn by looking at Hawk and that learned by looking at Odysseus? You seem to put these both forward as heroes, but they seem to be very different types of heroes. Um, do we learn the same from both of them, or are there kind of different things we learn from each of these fellows? I think there are some things that are the same, but some things that are different. Like for both Odysseus and um, Huckleberry, you see their incredible wit and so you can see how they implement that and 
um, how they make plans and do all that cool stuff. And then um, Huckleberry seems to be more of a the relatable character. Um, like one can probably relate to Odysseus in some ways, but not as much to Huckleberry as he has his own the moral dilemmas and the overall youth, I would say, like his youthfulness is more relatable to most readers, at least um, young readers. Um, I think I drifted a little bit from the question. I'm sorry, my brain is... Well, I guess, can you give us an example of one thing that we can learn from both of them and then, uh, you know, one thing that we can only learn from one of them? Sure. Um, well, I'd say the thing that we can learn from both of them is that one doesn't need to have great sh physical strength in order to do something heroic, as they both showed that in their stories. Um, and I would say that then Huckleberry Finns um, has an extra element um, that Odysseus's story does not have of um, being more like emotionally relatable. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> also, at the end of the third to last paragraph, you said that heroes needed to confront their faults or that um, heroes are those who are not necessarily without faults, but are able to confront them. What do you mean by a hero confronting his fault? Well, I don't know if I have the exact paragraph, but I think... Well, it's not, you know, I'm trying to like tell us. Can you repeat the question? I'm uh, sure. It's just looking at the end of your third to last paragraph. You were talking about how the fact that heroes have faults, but oftentimes need to confront those faults. I'm just wondering if you can give an example of a hero confronting his fault. Other than the example given, I gave in my, um, in the paragraph. Uh, yeah, I think I did actually forget that one. What, what was the example that you have there? Um, it was, it was Huckleberry, um, realizing that he was wrong, that slaves were not people and he, um, I can't talk right now, but how he um, realized that they are people and how he um, felt bad for it and tried to uh, not beat himself up about um, helping the slave mm -hmm. escape as much. All right, thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> uh, in your paragraph, you said, and this, I'm sorry, in your concluding paragraph, you said, a hero is much more than such physical assets. And when one realizes that one does not need them, one can realize that themselves have many common traits with these heroes, thus inspiring them further to try and help better the world, even in the littlest way. And so you're saying here that by having heroes that we are inspired to better the world. Um, do you really think we need heroes for that? Are heroes fairly optional or do you think they're pretty crucial to having us be inspired towards that sort of activity? I'm sure we could better the world without heroes to aspire to, but I think it's certainly easier for us, for one to aspire to, um, heroes and want to strive to be better rather than having to strive to be better without someone to look up to. 
So yes, but but I think it's just generally easier with heroes as, as role models. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you very much. Um, at the end of the second to last paragraph, you said that uh, this incredible strength is rare, especially as he was so young, and the strength has the ability to teach others to think for themselves, exercising the ability to examine situations and make their own decisions on the matter, and not simply follow the rest of society. Um, you know, you talk about heroes here as kind of people that are independent, thinking on their own. Um, and yet oftentimes the role of the hero seems to be working for society. Does a hero really think on their own or do they have to think for society and in accordance with what society needs? I think it would just depend on the hero because um, to me, hero is a broad, a broad category. So it would depend on the hero, but I think for these heroes, um, it's important for them to think for themselves. Mm -hmm. um, one thing I've noticed is how oftentimes um, people want to use the term hero. And it sounds like pretty much we're all heroes now. Everybody's a hero. Um, do you think by using the term so broadly, the term kind of gets to be meaningless? Or is there a way that heroes should be kind of limited to certain people? Well, if you're limiting it to certain people, that kind of kind of defeats my purpose and the purpose of my paper, which is kind of saying that these characters can show the common reader how to be a hero and how to like take what's inside them and use that to be their own hero and stuff. So I personally think that it's okay to have it so broadened because that's inspiring. Um, yeah. Yeah, I just kind of wonder if it's better to think of heroes as an inspiration to all of us to live better, but to say that we all become heroes, does that kind of cheapen the term? Probably, but I personally, at the moment, do not see anything wrong with that. Yeah, well, I mean, it's kind of like we want to say everybody is special. Everyone is special. And you say, well, okay, um, that may be a nice thing to say. Everybody wins, um, but then what happens to the concept? Are we destroying the concept by feeling nervous and when you say, well, no, there's some people who are not special. There's some people who are not heroes. That sounds really mean. And yet, um, when we say that everybody is a hero, everybody is special, uh, we've kind of lost something. I think as long as we stick to the general definition of a hero when referring to people as heroes, um, I think then it's okay, but if we are just like throwing the term around with no regard for the definition or anything like that at all, then that's when it starts to become a problem. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you very much. All right, and uh, so it'd be nice to have some more faces out there. If you onlineers want to put your video cameras on, we're going to open up for other questioning. Thank you very much, Joy. Uh, any other questions for Sarah? All right, Veronica, go ahead. Um, that was a really lovely paper, Sarah. I'm glad I got to hear it. I was just wondering, sort of going off of your and Mr. Hendricks' conversation, what would you say the definition of a hero is, since you were speaking so much about, you know, what are the consequences of broadening, broadening the definition, but what is the definition of hero that you operate under in this paper? But you're like super quiet, so I think what your question is, is kind of what is my definition of a hero, or what do I say the definition is? Yeah, basically. Okay. Um, well, basically, um, someone who does great things, um, someone who, yeah, does outstanding achievements, great things, um, and I want to say maybe someone who overall betters 
their story or the um, I can't think of the word right now for something outside of a story, but like someone who betters. Yeah. yeah, I'm not sure what exactly word, but yeah, someone who does great deeds and is admired for that, I guess. All right, thank you. Uh, I also wanted to ask about just, um, you know, who is a hero? And the, the, the thing that comes to my mind is I have, on a couple of occasions, met men, uh, particularly kind of war heroes, and uh, being somebody who kind of loves his war history, uh, I remember making a comment to, you know, what is it like to be such a hero, or, you know, you're such a hero, something like that, where I was gushing over them. And I remember one of them was quite stern and saying, no, I am not a hero. I was a common soldier and I did what soldiers do. I am not a hero. Uh, do you think it's ever appropriate for us to say, no, I am not a hero? Well, if it seems someone, if it's someone who, like in your example, I would say that that does still make them a hero. It may, may even make them a little bit more of a hero because they are um, humble about it and not flaunting it. I'm not saying that flaunting, um, flaunting one's achievements makes one less of a hero, but it... I think there's something to be said about the hum being humble about it. Mm -hmm. I guess being humble itself might be heroic. So, well, any other questions? Other uh, questions from Ms. Gentry? Um, I would like to go back to Odysseus. Um, with regard to Odysseus, you say, uh, these stories capture readers because they appear to be exciting tales on the surface, but they're also heroic tales that can give one motivation to act and to live in a particular way. Um, if somebody is really, you might say, a follower of Odysseus, the, you know, Odysseus is their hero, how would having Odysseus in that role of hero make you live in a particular way? What is the, you know the admirer of Odysseus look like in their life? I'm not sure if I understand the question. Well, I guess what you're saying is that by looking at the life of Odysseus, someone can come to a motivation to live in a particular way. Could you explain more what you mean by that? Well, sure. Um, I think my main point from Odysseus was that you can see that he is not only using his strength, um, in, especially in the um, parts of the stories that I mentioned, but that he is using his mind to get out of certain sticky situations and that um, an admirer of Odysseus may see that and be able to be like, oh, hey, I'm kind of smart too. Maybe I can use my minds to get out of my sticky situations. Kind of like that. Okay, so looking at the character of resourceful Odysseus and saying that, yeah. that could be an inspiration to use our mind as well to try to um, be able to solve particular problems that we're faced with. Uh, anything else that one would learn by looking at the life of Odysseus? I'm sure there is. I just cannot recall any at the moment. What about Huckleberry Finn? What are the things that you would say by looking at his particular life that would be life inspirations you would draw from someone like that? Well, there are several things. Um, The, he has the same um, intelligence factor that I mentioned about Odysseus. Um, he also has his 
youth, which I think maybe not to older readers as much, but younger readers can definitely look up to a hero who is similar in age um, to them. And there's the emotional and the, the, the uh, emotional baggage and stuff. Um, more stuff that um, younger readers would take and be like, oh, hey, that's in my life too. How inspiring. Kind of like that. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you very much. Any other questions? Uh, you also mentioned about the relatability of characters. At the end of uh, one of your paragraphs, you said, Odysseus and Huckleberry Finn are not only characters that readers can look up to, but also that they can relate to. And they can show readers what they can achieve, what they can be even with flaws. Um, <clears throat> you know, I've always thought about King David in this regard, where, you know, King David... Um, He's a pretty amazing man of God, you know, writes the 23rd Psalm, um, wins many of God's battles, and yet makes some pretty tragic mistakes in his life. A murder, adultery, um, some of the really big errors, uh, he commits them. And uh, would you say that in our lives, in the way he functions as a hero, is he, does he function in the, as a hero better because he has committed these sins or would it actually be better if you know king david had a bit more of a, a uh, squeaky clean resume without the you know really uh um failure moments in life that he had i'm not sure i'm not sure if i can really say he's less or more of a hero because of it but i think that his faults certainly can have bring more room for one to, um, I know I say this word a lot, relate to him and perhaps like see all the great things he did and maybe um, inspire them to change, I guess, better themselves. It depends on, yeah. Well, but why does King David committing such gross sins make us more likely to be inspired by his life than less? I mean, it seems like, I mean, well, <laughs> kind of particularly in our day and age, when somebody's gross moral failing comes out, people are often more inclined to say, you know, kick him out, get rid of this guy. You know, we thought he was so great, but let's get rid of him. Uh, you know, you seem to think that people having some errors makes them almost a better hero. Maybe not a better hero, but someone that more people can look up to. Because um, in my personal experience and my personal opinion, someone who is perfect is kind of bland like i'm gonna bring marvel into this i really don't like captain marvel because there's she doesn't have any flaws there's nothing that people can relate to she's kind of just this perfect robot and that makes me not like her but the more characters with flaws um I find myself more attached to and seeing, um, just liking, liking them and their story a lot better and, yeah, so, I can't remember where I was going with that. No, I, no, I think it's very interesting where, um, you know, we usually think of somebody as a hero who is preeminently good. And yet you're saying that in order to function well for us as a hero, they cannot be completely good. 
Yes. And um, is there a kind of a balance that needs to be struck there? Uh, I mean, uh, you get somebody with the, the more and more wicked things that they do, you kind of start wondering, well, is this really a hero, <laughs> you know? They're sure relatable, but I don't know if this is a good person to be, you know, uh, putting my moral star on. Is there a sort of balance there? I think there does need to be a balance once it gets to, once there's a certain, to a certain extent, but I don't know how um, black and white the lines are, if that makes any sense. Do you have an idea of a character that to you seems to present a good example of at least relatability and yet still a sort of paragon to live up to? Um, no one that comes up at the moment, although I'm sure once I get off conferencing 20 minutes later, I'm going to think of one. Well, yes, that's okay. always kind of the way the brain works. So, all right, Veronica, a question. Yeah, sort of going off of this here, I'll try to speak more loudly so you can hear me. Um, tying this into the earlier question of de the definition of a hero, I was wondering what you would say to the characters sort of in the popular eye who are maybe not good characters, but people still admire them for one reason or another. They may seem sympathetic or just flashy, like that's a cool person, I kind of like that. Sort of this fascination with the like anti-hero or sympathetic villain type character. So what would you say the difference between that sort of character type and your idea of the relatable hero is? They're like they seem like they're different things, but in what way are they different? I don't know. Um for, as for the uh the like anti-hero or the um, sympathetic villain character, I don't think it would necessarily be bad to look up to them as long as they have things that are good that they teach, if that makes sense. Like, um, I can't think of anyone specific at the moment, but say there's a villain and he does bad things, but he also, it could say if he had like a good motive or something, um, then I would say that that's not completely bad to look up to him. Um, but yeah, I'm not sure exactly about what I would think or say about your question. Okay, so continuing with that, would you say your idea of a hero is more along the lines of Aristotle's description of a tragic hero as somebody who can't be perfect, but they can't be completely depraved? Like, you know, a Creon or an Oedipus who's like, they're trying to do the right thing, but maybe they're going about it in the wrong way. Um, and that's what, like, we can admire the desire for good in them, but also just see like, this guy made mistakes. That does sound accurate, yeah. All right, thank you. Other questions? All right, I think we'll stop there. Very well done, Miss Gentry. Thank you very much.